for us, it's really learning and advocacy all together and also understand and networking. It was such a vibrant time, so much hope because everyone really felt that this is going to change the world. It's sort of, it is the kind of thing that will change the way the society is organized, information society, knowledge society. So we were involved in all of them up to, so 2020, 2003 was the first summit and then the second summit was 2005 in Geneva and after that the Internet Governance Forum was set up by the UN and from the beginning we were involved in that so all of that all of that but every year from from then on until now is where we've been so much involved so those are the kinds of um, involvement that we Hi welcome to the show my pleasure to be here as your host just call me T+ this show is called Inno Minds, a forum for leaders in tech and politics to discuss how to solve today's problems with today's tools. Today, our special guest is Chat Garcia Romulo, Executive Director of the Association for Progressive Communications, or APC. I'm also here with Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. Today, we talk about global tech activism, and how to make sure we can use tech to secure our rights. Okay. So before we get started, I want to introduce our two guests today. Chat Garcia Romulo is a human rights activist who became the executive director of the Association for Progressive Communications in April 2017. The APC is a network of organizations founded in 1990 to empower people to use information and communications technologies to contribute to equitable human development and social justice. Hi Chat, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here and excited to have this conversation. Audrey Tang is Taiwan's digital minister. She became Taiwan's youngest minister without portfolio in 2016 when she headed the public digital innovation space. She has been a hacktivist for over two decades. She is also a promoter of open source innovation. Hi Audrey. I want to jump in by discussing the concept of internet rights. This is basically the idea that there are new human rights important in the digital age. The APC has been putting out its list of internet rights since 2006. I want to ask Chat, why is it important to have a concept of internet rights? Well, look, in IPC, we believe that internet is a public good. And to ensure that we access it, it's access, used, developed, and governed as such, then it's important to really have a framework so that we understand how pe that, people, it's, that people are not accessing, that there's um, people who may not access uh, the internet in the same way as others. There are the, there's a big divide at the moment. So the idea that um, to be able to really uh, benefit from the potential of the internet, and as we see now with all the, with the full digitalization of society, um, there are impacts as well. Um, the impacts of internet to the exercise of our rights. In 2012, for example, um, one of the things that came out is a UN resolution on ensuring that our rights are the same online and offline. So it's really a framework so that the potential of Internet as we know it is accessed as well as enjoyed by people in the same way, equally, um, and that the impacts are of in, in relation to how our, you know, how we improve our lives, how we access our freedom of expression it's, and, and other rights, um, whatever impacts there are, 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 we have redress for it. So it it's really provides that framework for us to really look at, to, 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 to um, you know, really look at the potential of the internet um, for our lives. How do you think about the relationship between traditional human rights, like freedom of movement, and these newer internet rights like the right to open standards? Yeah, look, I think the, the thing that we need to understand, that we understand as because we do, we work with tech is that the technology is developed um, with standards so that they can be, they can be, be, be interoperable, for example, right? And all of these standards are sometimes developed without an understanding of how people use them. So the open standards really is so that there's much more accessibility in designing them, in setting the standards, and understanding how, 
uh, really how people use them and how it impacts on people. So I think that's a kind of thing that needs understanding. Technology has always been a difficult, there's, there's sort of like a mystery to it. And I think when we are with, um, with um, traditional human rights, um, human rights issues, it's more about how people exercise their rights. So there needs to be much more understanding of how technology is developed, how it's shaped, and how we can really contribute to the design of it so that it works for us. I think that's, the really, that's really what's important here. I mean, one example is how, for example, gender, what is a, a how, how do you design technology that works for women, for example, or takes into consideration gender differences? So that's a kind of, you know, that's a kind of uh, research and, and usefulness, I think, when we're talking about open standards. What about you? Audrey, how do you think of internet rights? Yeah, so uh, as a signatory uh, to the Declaration uh, for the Future of the Internet, uh, an important document with uh, more than 60 partners worldwide to uphold the original promise of the Internet, the Internet was designed as a network of networks. So any community that wants to make sense of what they want to interact with uh, each other on the Internet uh, should be able to tap into this, what we call end-to-end -end principle, to co-create something uh, to define their future together using internet as a common good. Now, uh, if we don't have open standards, if we have vendor lock-ins, if we have the mm. decision that make only economic sense but no civic sense, we're essentially foreclosing future possibilities, future communities, uh, future developments of the potentials of the cultures and so on. So in the mode, our main idea is to free the future, meaning that keeping the internet open as a network of networks so that it, the fully realized potential of today will not block the even more fully realized potentials of future generations. I have a follow-up question. How do you think about the balance between tech design and regulation when it comes to safeguarding internet rights? Let's go to Audrey first. What do you think? Sure. Um, I think uh, on the internet, norms are very important because, as I mentioned, there's a network of networks. So there's no coercive power from one small network to another small network on the internet. However, norms do emerge. For example, uh, generally, uh, people don't like their emails uh, to be snooped. On the other hand, nobody likes spam emails either. So a norm was developed so that people can manually flag something as spam and have the fingerprint but not the content shared uh, with the spam house and other international uh, clearing houses for such signatures to block the spams together without eroding the freedom of expression. Now, Taiwan is part of this ecosystem of counter spam, but we did not ever have an act for counter spam in our jurisdiction. So regulations are needed, I believe, when there's no clear norms, but regulations need to be designed in a humble way so that when a better norm emerges, it's not blocked by the regulation that's already in place. Yeah, that's a really great example, Audrey. I think sometimes what our experience has been that um, the regulations sometimes um, are implemented or adopted by countries without really understanding the impact of it. And because there's not very deep understanding, possibly in the same way that you have in relation to the technology itself and bringing technologists who really understand you know, um, how the internet works. So this regulation that's really, the intention is, is, being, is more to, for example, um, close down freedom of expression mm. to penalize. So the openness of the internet is then compromised. And I think that's the kind of challenge we have when we're talking about regulation and standards. I think really standards are more, for in, in, in my view, it's much more something that you arrive at because you work with stakeholders. You work with people who, in fact, um, understand how it works, either their technologies, their technical bodies, they are, you know, civil society like ourselves who understand how it impacts um, the community. And I think that's where the, you know, the idea of these different stakeholders is really important when we're talking about setting standards and the state then, of course, you know, the state or governments are the ones who really look at regulation and that's their role. 
because they took the bearers. They need to make sure that there are regulation that really works for people and protects people's rights, as well as provides the resources that people need when it comes to the internet. I see. Chat, can you provide an instance where your organization has effectively helped implement internet regulation where there wasn't one? Yeah. So let me, maybe one example I could give you is these um, norms that have been developed over the years on um, freedom of expression and the internet. So for, for a long time, you know, one of the things that have really happened is this, the opening, the internet has really provided um, a, 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 a forum, a way for people to have new ways of expressing themselves. And in ways that are, you know, that are not... Um, constrained, let's say, by traditional media, et cetera. So that has really meant that it has become so important for people. But, as soon, but, 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 but what's happened, though, is that there, because it's so, it wasn't really, there were no norms in that, at that point, there were governments or states that might have, that, that have um, it, let's say, uses, you know, like rules or regulation that, that's related to traditional media. So one of the things that we really looked at, and we've worked with the uh, U, uh, UN Special Rapporteur at that time, it was Frank Leroux, on, uh, on looking at what are the kinds of norms around freedom of expression and the internet. So one thing that came out of that is to say, look, you know, freedom, your, our, our rights online is the same offline, or, or, or maybe the other, other way around. We exercise our freedom of expression online, offline, it should also be the same rights we express online. So that's a norm. And that's the start. There was a human rights resolution in 2012. And every year since then, there's been different resolutions every year that built on that. So that's many years now. And of course, there are new issues that have come up. So this is the development of norms. And we contributed to that. But there's many others who contributed to that, to the thinking around that. So that's one area, right, that you sort of like, that has really helped us in, in looking at what do you then, what then are the limits of freedom of expression in relation to the internet? And the only things that really came up there is that one, if there's real threat to people, and number two, if it's reputation. And that is already enshrined in, in human rights standards in the past. So there's so there are many examples, and I think you will find a lot of examples in, in setting those rights. Now, that then can be then used locally in national context to say, look, you know, this is a resolution that says this, this is the standards that we need to use. So that we're not, we are not throttling the internet. In fact, we're opening it up, and but we are setting standards that are consistent with universal standards that many states uh, recognize. Yeah, first, uh, of course, I totally agree uh, that the rights that we enjoy, especially in democratic societies, uh, should be the same online. I would also say that in Taiwan, uh, we emphasize uh, broadband as a human right uh, because you can more fully express yourself uh, with hand gestures and real-time video <laughs> if you enjoy broadband access. Uh, and uh, we want to ensure that even in the most rural places, the most remote islands, through any way possible, uh, whether is submarine cables, microwave, satellites, uh, and so on, we still uh, guarantee the same broadband rights uh, because we truly believe that real-time interactions like this uh, builds the fabric of trust. Uh, if you don't have broadband but just a little bit of internet, this asynchronous communication through text sometimes uh, creates more misunderstandings. In today's world, the free flow of information on the internet is crucial for creating informed opinions. What are your thoughts on the current state of this matter, chat? Yeah, look, I mean, the one example of that, look, uh, I think that's the, that's, the, that's the kind of protection that one can, can look at. You know? But at the same time, we do know that the, that the same kinds of, rep <laughs> uh, I guess, there's also what's now called as digital authoritarianism, where in fact the restrictions that you see offline have, is happening online because it's of the power really of the internet, isn't it? I mean, it's really because of that, because this is where I think it will. It now depends on, on different jurisdictions. I think that's that's the one thing to look at. I mean, in my country, in the Philippines, we've seen that it's one of the most known cases, if you like, of the the use of the internet or the throttling of the internet 
and the you know of, of one online very effective online media which is Rappler and the the kinds of uh, you know the kinds of restrictions um, that a state can can use if they are if you know if there are things that they don't really want to hear if they think that they don't want to you know that that, that is that they don't want you know critical critical um, of the government or policies etc that actually happens so I think some of it some of it is really not to do with the internet itself it has to do with this uh, we have to do with government regulation that is um, that really does not allow full freedom of expression, whether it's in whatever form, right? And one of them, of course, is most powerful is the internet. I think the other part I wanted to, and, and I'm not sure if this responds to your question around the standards, right? Which is about the algorithm, and that is about net neutrality. I, one of the things that we, we, we stand for is also net neutrality, where we're saying that, look, you know, there needs to be equal access and equal flow of information. But Again, I think this is where it, I feel it's become a lot more complicated, a lot, and that I think the sway of of big corporations, big, big platforms, and profit that now is so much so much um, def defines what we defines the space and the internet has has uh, you know has uh, this is the, this is a challenge for us. So I I I, I think here is where regulation and standards matter. It's, it's uh, because you have such powerful companies, if you like, you know, that really hold sway on the way that um, the internet and the digital environment is, is uh, shaped. Uh, I would like to read a few uh, APC uh, right declarations. Right? So the freedom of expression is followed uh, immediately by peaceful assembly and association rights, uh, namely the right to freedom from censorship and the right to engage in online protest uh, as long as it's nonviolent. So uh, I think it's very important uh, that you brought this shadow ban uh, example uh, because uh, the censorship of uh, assembly uh, a peaceful organization online is not through the silencing of the freedom of expression, but from those uh, organizers uh, who don't want their critiques uh, to have the same organizing power uh, as they have. Uh, and so the, they decimate right, the organizing power, the reach uh, of those voices. Uh, and so I think we have a pretty strong norm now in democratic countries that as long as this is a nonviolent uh, protest or organization, they should in enjoy the same reach uh, as journalists uh, who um, are whistleblowers or people who uh, point out that something is wrong with the society. Because if we do not protect uh, the association and peaceful assembly rights, when there's really something happening, like a upcoming virus or something, uh, the society does not have the mm. chance to discover it. The APC Internet Rights Charter is indeed a crucial document that envisions what a completely free internet would be like. Chat. Could you please describe to our audience what such an internet might look like? I think maybe I give an example of um, how we have worked with um, feminists, activists, as well as gender diverse LGBTIQ activists, and we work with many of them. So one of the things that we learned, and it was very early on, um, that we in our work is that many of um, the activists found a safe space on the internet. This was early days, and it would have been, what, 15, 20 years ago. And, the, and they sort of, because they couldn't organize um, offline, I mean, they, it was very dangerous for them. So they found safe spaces on the internet and really found each other. So to me, that, that really, um, at that time, I guess it was still under the radar. <laughs> it was sort of like beginning to use to uh, discover it and, and connect. And people really found, activists really found each other. Um, and in fact, in the research that we've done, one of the most powerful um, organizing tools that they use was the internet. But of course, now it's a different story. You know, it's much more, and many of those um, instances there's a, there's a lot more regular, 
on the one hand, yes, we need regulation, but on the other hand, there's a lot of regulation of the internet. But it's it. What is interesting though is that the what is being what is being what is being policed in the real life is also what's being policed online. It's really a continuum, whether it's uh, sexual expression, whether it's um, you know embodiment our bodies. That's, that's, it's the same, you know. Really, that's what it's. It's, not, it's um. It's ways of finding, closing those spaces that we found that have provided, provided us freedom to talk to each other to really play. So one of the things. So so, <laughs> one of the things we we have done is uh, the feminist principle of painting, and this is through through, through several years of really convening. Uh, feminists, activists, as well as sexual rights activists together and saying, okay, if the, if the internet is going to be feminist, what would it look like? So we sort of like through that exercise, we have, I think it's 17 principles, or I can't remember how many principles of uh, feminism, of a feminist internet. And I think that's one way for us to sort of imagine. And one of the things that really to me, um, learning is this embodiment right because we we need the embodiment is so is so is so um basic when we when we think of feminism and how we and how we embody um our, our own politics so i think that's one important thing and the thing of there's so much there's so much violence, gender-based violence online and in, in society. But on the other hand, technology also is an, is an opportunity to play. Um, it's an opportunity for pleasure. So, uh, you, so, it, so it's, also, um, it's also bringing that into, into a, um, when, when, we, when we envision internet, so that it's not just a place for, you know, for risks. Because that's the danger of it, right? That we lose that, we lose the innovativeness, we lose the play, we lose the pleasure, and we use we, we lose the empowerment. Yeah, um, I think uh, as I mentioned, as a network of networks, uh, there's no one size fits all design uh, that would be a safe space for everyone. Uh, indeed, uh, what's so-called contextual collapse uh, appears uh, when something that is uh, felt safe by a group of people uh, and then uh, they interact on a flattened social media with another group of people and uh, what uh, seemed like totally ordinary become uh, really strange and even offensive uh, to some other mm. groups. And this is why, uh, of course, we've seen early signs of people migrating uh, to federated like Mastodon uh, social sphere. Uh, where they can set their own codes of conduct with the communities they trust. Uh, and this alignment to the community is even more important than what's written in the code of conduct. Uh, what's useful for uh, every member of the community is knowing that everyone can participate in the norm setting process by co-creating the code of conduct together for their particular community, which is, uh, again, still interoperable with the wider Fediverse, uh, but they feel safe. Uh, in the uh, norms and rules that they have set uh, in their particular community instance. So to me, uh, being true to the network of networks means stop treating uh, people as users, right? Because if you treat people as users, which is a term drug makers use, I'm sure, uh, is that uh, you only care about their consumption and addiction and so on. Uh, but actually, uh, it is those networks of people caring about each other that is real. And the internet is just a fabric of trust to build such a uh, trusting relationship upon. So alignment to community norms, I think that's the most important thing. And what I would see uh, both in the transformative technology that's the internet and also in the future um, of assistive intelligence and language models. Can I ask a question to, sure. to you, Audrey? Uh -huh. So one of the things that has come up really, and, and look, I, I totally agree, one of the things we are now, so, so one thing that we really have um, really do with our, with, together with our members and our partners is that is sort of like think about infrastructure as a, as a for, for ourselves right and infrastructure not only as technology but practice mm -hmm. yeah? it, 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 that's important and that's where I, I see the community standards coming up so Mastodon said it, we're also looking at Fediverse but we're also trying to bring others because it's, it's not an it's not easy you know for 
for many because it's it's like this because uh, it's convenient. You mm-hmm. know, social uh, social media makes it very convenient, um, and it and it takes it really takes time as well as. So what 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 have you found? I guess one the question is so I have two questions. What have you found that is um, that makes it that makes it attractive for for communities to take up, yeah, um, and to really um, think of think of the, their their own agency in relation to technology. The other question, um, related but not not directly, I suppose, is the the with the assistive technology, one of, as you know, there's, uh, the diff- now there's a lot of discussion about the chat GPT. Mm-hmm. So I, I really, I mean, we're also trying to figure out, okay, what's useful, what's not useful. How do we engage this? Because it's, it's going to happen, mm-hmm. uh, happening, and there will be more interest, and there's a lot of hype about it. So I want to really, yeah hear from you how you think and how you're thinking about it and how you think it could be useful or not for, let's say, for the work that you do in Taiwan. Yeah, so uh, the two questions, one about how to ease the adoption of more personalized human-centered technology, and second, uh, where does the language model technologies fit uh, into this reality? Mm -hmm. Uh, So so the first, uh, I would like to say, um, there's this, uh, I don't know whether you know, uh, OpenAI works with Be My Eyes, uh, which is a uh, app company uh, that used to uh, and still do connect people with seeing difficulties with volunteers online who interpret mm-hmm. uh, what they encounter in the world through audio, so to describe the world to them. Uh, and uh, the language model uh, company, OpenAI, uh, introduced this idea of a virtual volunteer so that even when nobody is online to help this uh, person of seeing difficulties, uh, still their language model will describe the world uh, in an interactive way, exactly like a virtual volunteer. So which means this person with seeing difficulty can ask the language model, uh, so who is the person on the left, uh, focus on their hands, uh, what are they holding, and so on. They can still uh, you know, get answers in real time, uh, even if no human volunteers uh, happen to be online. Uh, and so this is what I mean by a assistive uh, intelligence, right? It is intelligent, uh, means it answers your questions, and it's assistive, means that the dignity of the person uh, is of utmost uh, importance. Now, uh, mm-hmm. I, I believe this interface is much more natural to use than the uh, previous interfaces that require people to learn programming languages or learn design, uh, CSS, HTML, and so on, in order to express ourselves. Uh, so just by speaking uh, to one laptop or to your phone uh, and listening uh, to their response or a real-time synthesized video, uh, I think that will massively decrease uh, the uh, anxiety of people embracing transformative technologies. Uh, Uh, And the other thing I think that's going to be very important is that the entire language model, even the larger ones, uh, now fits on a USB stick. So the, you can think of it the entire internet mm. compressed uh, with an interactive agent. It's just around a giga, um, 100 or so gigabytes, right? So easily fits on a USB stick. Uh, and so even in autocracies, in places that suffer from censorship, if you have that USB stick, you have the pretty much the whole internet. Uh, and in your local language that can interact with you uh, as you can ask that mini internet uh, a question, right? So uh, I think my one of my favorite author, Ted Chiang, uh, referred to it as a blurry JPEG that compresses the entire internet. <laughs> and uh, while it's useful, uh, of course, in democratic countries, it's doubly useful in autocracies. Absolutely. Thank you for your insights. I want to take a step back and ask Chad, how did you start your internet activism? <laughs> Yeah, look, I sent my first email, and, and I remember it very clearly, right? And that's how I got started. I sent my first email at the World Conference on Women in 1995 and in Huairo in China. So I'll tell you, the, the story is important for APC because that's when I got in touch with APC. It's the women, it was the women's program. You see, they were pioneers, and what they did was they set up at, in in Huayro, they set up uh, 200 computers, and it became like a hub. 
And really, there were 40 women who, who set it up and who were teaching women all over the world how to use email. And it was sort of like a thing that nobody really knew what it was about, right? So it, it, I don't know if you remember the sound of, <laughs> of the connection of email when you connect at the time, dial up phone, right? So that, that, that was when I, I first had my email, my first email, and that's how I got hooked. And I started to think, okay, so what is this about? And I, you know, and that's when I discovered and researched really the potential of it. And it's and it is that. So small, small example of how um, you know how powerful that the connections can be. And and maybe a little story about that too is that 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 um, <laughs> that uh, center that they ran was pretty much. Um, so it was next to the media center at that time, and there were some, you know, there were some restrictions to the media center in China. You could imagine. So what happened was media was like moving towards that center and provided them the connection that was free and open to the world. So it, it, that's how I, I got started, and from then on, I never looked back. Um, I, I joined APC in twenty in uh, after that. I was after I was a feminist then, and it was only APC that was really focusing on on feminism, women's rights, and the internet. That very at that time there were very few organizations who really understood that this is important for women's rights. Do you remember what that first email was about? I am so curious. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't remember what the email was, but yeah, but I did. <laughs> The magic of the internet, you see it on, on screen. Same question for you, Audrey. Do you remember your first email? Well, it was probably on uh, the dial-up BBS uh, through FidoNet or something. It's not strictly speaking uh, internet because Taiwan already had a very vibrant culture of dialing up uh, BBS. Uh, and there's mm. a limited exchange, of course, between those uh, modem-powered uh, BBS systems. Uh, and then I realized uh, when I discovered uh, the World Wide Web uh, that it is now possible uh, for everyone to be a system operator, right? Previously, people who uh, can afford a lot of te uh, telephone lines uh, become the de facto setter of the rule uh, of the small mm -hmm. space. Uh, that's how uh, my first exposure to the Fediverse uh, began, because that began with mm -hmm. the BBS, the, literally the, in the network of networks. Uh, but then when the World Web began, it became very apparent uh, that everyone can be a uh, so-called web master, uh, of course, now that we don't use that word anymore, uh, web administrator or operator uh, that uh, don't set the rules for everyone, but on the other hand, it's not subject to the whims uh, of the BBS system operators either. So there's a certain sense of liberation. And uh, uh, I remember, I think in 96, uh, when I first uh, browsed on a lot of, as I mentioned, uh, the new World Wide Web, a lot of the my favorite web pages went and black uh, and with a blue ribbon uh, and they're joined in solidarity uh, to uh, against the uh, the communication decency act right the CDA uh, which would block uh, free speech uh, by making everyone a librarian uh, subject to a lot of regulations so uh, I think that's the point when I uh, suddenly realized that this powerful network of knowledge of uh, commons uh, for learning can also be a powerful international National Solidarity Network to advocate for human rights, even though that uh, happens in a jurisdiction unrelated uh, to Taiwan at the moment, uh, in the U.S., but we just joined the fight, uh, the struggle, uh, because we care about the same values, uh, no matter how many miles or kilometers uh, separate us. So I think that's the time when I realized the neighborhoods online is defined by the proximity of value and never by proximity of uh, geopolitics. Thinking in terms of value is indeed more important than thinking in terms of geographical distance. Let's go back to the beginning of your journey at APC. Chat. What were some of the key milestones? Um, yeah, so I, I first joined APC to look at some um, lessons in women's networking. So that's the kind of work that I did with APC. And it, it really is for us to understand um, how we move forward, right? So there's many things that APC was doing. One is obviously on on rights, you know, looking at um, in the Internet Rights Charter. The other thing that 
we were so much involved with is the uh, World Summit on the Information Society. That was a long process. Many different, you know, preparation, the preparatory meetings, and then the summits over five, minimum of five years. So, and it really was a, 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 a learning for us, it's really learning and advocacy all together and also understand and networking. It was such a vibrant time, so much hope, because everyone really felt that this is going to change the world. It's sort of, it is the kind of thing that will change the way the society is organized, information society, knowledge society. So we were involved in all of them up to, so it's 2020. 2003 was the first summit and then the second summit was 2005 in Geneva and after that the Internet Governance Forum was set up by the UN and from the beginning we were involved in that so all of that all of that but every year from from then on until now is where we've been so much involved so those are the kinds of um, involvement that NPC has and it's really bringing our membership together um, trying to to really look at perspectives that are not only global north because you know the experience the way that internet is experienced the way that it's the way that it is affordable or it's not the same everywhere so what's important there is to understand the diversity as well as the gaps no the divides that that need to be included in thinking through um policies, in thinking through resources, in, th in thinking through how you deploy technology. So that's the kind of work that we did at that time, bringing, bringing together civil society organizations in different ways. It's good to know that an organization like APC provides a global platform for diverse groups to voice their opinions on the state of the global internet. It's through associations like these that the promises of technology can be realized to their full potential. If you like today's episode, be sure to subscribe, share and let us know what you think. See you next time on Innovative Minds. Hello, uh, I'm Chad Garcia Ramelo. I'm the Executive Director of the Association for Progressive Communications. See you at Taiwan Plus. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. See you on Taiwan Plus.